accidents, illnesses, violence, murder, natural disasters. These can be God's punishment as a tragic consequence if you commit a grave sin blasphemy against God, just like these people. Welcome to Timeless Bible Tales where we share biblical stories that resonate with everyday life. If you're someone who loves God and is interested in the Bible, please help us spread the good news of the Gospels by giving us likes, shares, and subscriptions to our channel. Your support motivates us to create more valuable content for the Christian community. All right, we'll dive into eight figures who publicly blasphemed God and together uncover the tragic fates they faced in their later lives for cursing the sacred land with special significance for the Christian community, the state of Israel. These people openly mocked God's image and the beloved land of Israel, and they all faced curses even paying with their own lives. Remember that blasphemy against God never leads to positive outcomes. We should always respect and honor God. Israel, also known as the land of Israelites, holds great significance in the Bible and in Christianity. It is the land in the Middle East that God promised to Abraham and his descendants. The nation of Israel has a long history that spans thousands of years. In the Bible, Israel is often referred to as the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. After being freed from slavery in Egypt, the Israelites, under the leadership of Moses, traveled through the wilderness for 40 years before entering the land of Canaan, which became their home. Throughout its history, Israel has faced various challenges, conflicts, and conquests. It was divided into two kingdoms, Israel the Northern Kingdom and Judah the Southern Kingdom, and eventually both were taken captive by foreign powers. However, God promised to restore and return to this land, which has happened at various stages throughout history. The city of Jerusalem holds special significance in Israel. It is the city where the temple was built, originally by King Solomon, and it became the political and spiritual center of the country. Jerusalem is also the place where Jesus was crucified and resurrected, making it an important location for Christians. Because of this high spiritual significance, from the moment Abraham was chosen to be the recipient and transmitter of blessings, he not only received blessings from God, but also became a blessing and instrument to bless others. This blessed relationship not only defined Abraham's destiny, but also paved the way for all his descendants. God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, 3 echoes through the ages, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This ancient promise remains a guiding light, shaping the rise and fall of nations and serving as a divine assurance of friendship and favor to Abraham. Regardless of one's wealth, power, or fame, it is essential to recognize that no human has the right to consider themselves superior to the Almighty and challenge his authority by mocking him. In the past, there have been instances where famous and influential individuals engaged in such behavior and tragically met untimely ends as a result. Here are several notable examples. Number one, Hugo Rapiel Chaves, president of Venezuela. Hugo Chavez, former president of Venezuela, had a complicated relationship with Israel during his time in office. Chavez was known for his anti-imperialist and anti-Israel stance, aligning himself with countries and leaders who were critical of Israeli policies. Chavez condemned Israel's actions in the Israel-Palestine conflict, especially its military operations in the Gaza Strip. He accused Israel of human rights violations and called it an occupying force. Chavez also expressed support for the Palestinian cause and recognized Palestine as a sovereign state. Under Chavez's leadership, Venezuela strained diplomatic relations with Israel. In 2009, following Israel's military offensive in Gaza, Venezuela severed diplomatic relations with Israel and expelled the Israeli ambassador. Chavez also established closer ties with countries hostile to Israel, such as Iran and Syria. The president paid the tragic end after more than two years of battling cancer. Chavez's illness was first revealed in June 2011, when he announced that he had been diagnosed with cancer. He underwent several treatments, including surgery and chemotherapy, both in Venezuela and abroad. Despite his health challenges, Chavez continued to serve as president of Venezuela and ran for re-election in 2012, winning another term. Hugo Chavez died on March 5, 2013, after a battle with cancer. As Christians, it is important to approach political issues with clarity and a search for understanding while promoting peace, justice, and respect for all people. As a leader, a politically influential ruler, it is unfortunate that Hugo could have done better by maintaining a more friendly relationship, but he chose to act in extremes and made efforts against Israel and met a tragic end at the end of his life. Number two, Saddam Hussein, Islamic dictator. 
Saddam Hussein emerged as a prominent figure in Iraq in the late 20th century with his dictatorial, oppressive, brutal, and disregard for human rights regime, and was seen as an enemy of Israel during his time as president of Iraq. His regime was characterized by authoritarianism, censorship, and a cult of personality. In 1980, Saddam launched a devastating war with neighboring Iran. The conflict lasted eight years and caused enormous loss of life and resources. Despite international condemnation, he continued the war, leading to widespread suffering. Most notably, in 1990, Saddam invaded Kuwait, triggering the Gulf War. Not stopping there, Saddam Hussein's government showed hostility towards Israel and launched Scud missiles at Israel in an attempt to draw them into the conflict to seize Kuwait. This drive was supposed to have a serious impact on the state of Israel, the sacred land protected by God, but fortunately this effort failed completely. Then a coalition of nations, led by the United States, intervened to liberate Kuwait. Iraq was completely defeated, but the tyrant Saddam remained in power and continued to act in defiance of God and violate human rights. The Prime Minister's cruel treatment of people went against God's commandment, and as a result, he received a harsh sentence death. In 2003, the United States invaded Iraq, aiming to overthrow Saddam's regime. After months of fighting, the U.S. military captured him near his hometown of Tikrit on December 13, 2003. His capture marked the end of his brutal reign. Saddam Hussein was put on trial for crimes against humanity. Specifically, he was convicted of the murder of 148 Iraqi shites in the town of Dujail. In 2006, he was sentenced to death by hanging. On December 30, 2006, Saddam was executed. The story of Saddam Hussein is a cautionary tale, a reminder that absolute power corrupts absolutely and that the pursuit of domination can lead to tragic consequences. His name still evokes memories of oppression, conflict, and the fragility of human rights. And this is a bitter end for someone who dared to take Israel and its people to war, an unjust war against God's will. Number three, Muammar Gaddafi, Liberian politicians. Muammar Muhammad Abuminar Gaddafi, whose name echoed across the vast Libyan desert, emerged as the dominant figure in the country's political landscape. His journey from young revolutionary to hardliner was marked by ambition, brutality, and a relentless pursuit of power. In 1969, Gaddafi led a group of young army officers in a coup against King Idris I, who had ruled Libya since its independence. The revolution was swift, and Gaddafi declared himself head of the new government. His vision was bold a socialist, pan-Arab state free of Western influence. As Colonel Gaddafi tightened his grip on Libya, he implemented sweeping reforms. Oil wealth flowed into the country, funding ambitious infrastructure, education and healthcare projects. But beneath the surface, dissent simmered. Gaddafi's regime silenced the opposition and imprisoned and tortured those who challenged his authority. His anti-Western stance and support for revolutionary movements around the world made him both admired and hated. And Israel was one of his enemies. In modern times, the State of Israel was established in 1948, fulfilling biblical prophecies about the return of the Jews to their homeland. Today, Israel is a vibrant and diverse country known for its historical and religious sites, including the Western Wall, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and the Sea of Galilee. For Christians, Israel is not just a physical place, but also a spiritual place. It is often seen as a reminder of God's faithfulness and his plan of redemption for all humanity through Jesus Christ. Many Christians visit Israel as a pilgrimage to follow in the footsteps of Jesus and strengthen their faith. It is important to note that Christians believe that God's plan of salvation is not limited to a particular land or country. The Christian message is universal and God's love and salvation are for all people, no matter where they are. During his lifetime, Muammar Gaddafi had a long-standing conflict with Israel during his time as leader of Libya. Gaddafi was known for his strong anti-Israel stance and his support for many Palestinian and Arab causes. Gaddafi repeatedly criticized Israel, viewing it as an occupying force and oppressor of the Palestinian people. He openly supported the Palestinian resistance against Israel and advocated the establishment of a Palestinian state with Jerusalem as its capital. Gaddafi condemned what he saw as Israel's aggression and violations of international law. Gaddafi was also a staunch supporter of the Palestine Liberation Organization PLO and its leader Yasser Arafat. He provided financial aid, weapons, and political support to the PLO and other Palestinian factions. Gaddafi's support for the Palestinian cause made him a hero to many Palestinians and other Arab states. 
In addition to his anti-Israel rhetoric, Gaddafi pursued policies that sought to isolate and weaken Israel diplomatically. He actively worked to strengthen ties with countries hostile to Israel, such as Iran and Syria. Gaddafi supported militant groups such as Hezbollah in Lebanon, which engaged in military conflicts with Israel. Gaddafi's brutal actions to maintain control of Libya sparked outrage both at home and abroad for the suffering his brutal dictatorship wrought. Muammar Gaddafi's tragic end came during the Libyan civil war in 2011. As the Arab Spring swept across the region, Libya was engulfed in protests and uprisings against Gaddafi's authoritarian rule. The Libyan people, inspired by the desire for freedom and democracy, took to the streets demanding change. Gaddafi responded to the uprising with force, unleashing his military and security forces on the protesters. This brutal crackdown led to a full-scale armed conflict between Gaddafi loyalists and rebel forces, supported by international intervention. NATO, with a mission to protect civilians, launched airstrikes against Gaddafi's military infrastructure. The conflict escalated, resulting in significant loss of life and displacement of people across the country. Gaddafi's regime faced mounting pressure and international isolation. In October 2011, Gaddafi's convoy was targeted by a NATO airstrike in Sirte, his hometown. He survived the attack but was subsequently captured by rebel forces. Disturbing videos and images emerged, showing Gaddafi being beaten and humiliated by his captors. On October 20, 2011, Muammar Gaddafi was killed under unknown circumstances. His death marked the end of his four-decade-long rule and the fall of his regime. The exact details of how he died remain disputed, but it is widely believed that he was shot during the chaos of the conflict. Not only the country of Israel in particular, but to mock God is to disrespect, dishonor, or ignore him. It is a serious offense committed by those who have no fear of God or who deny his existence. The most easily recognized form of mockery is disrespect typified by verbal insults or other acts of disdain. It is associated with ridicule, scoffing, and defiance. Mockery is a dishonoring attitude that shows low estimation, contempt, or even open hostility. In the Bible, mockery is a behavior and attitude shown by the fool Psalm 7422, the wicked Psalm 1-1, the enemy Psalm 7410, the hater of knowledge Proverbs 122-13-1, the proud Psalm 1951 Isaiah 3717, and the unteachable Proverbs 1512. A mocker goes beyond mere lack of judgment to make a conscious decision for evil. Mockers are without a spirit of obedience, teachability, discernment, wisdom, worship, or faith. Those who mock God will mock the people of God as well. The prophet Jeremiah became the laughingstock of all my people and was mocked in song all day long, Lamentations 3.14. Mockery of God's prophets was commonplace 2 Chronicles 36.16. Nehemiah was mocked by his enemies, Nehemiah 2.19. Elisha was mocked by the youths of Bethel 2 Kings 2.23. And of course, our Lord Jesus was mocked by Herod and his soldiers, Luke 23.11 by the Roman soldiers, Mark 15, 20, Luke 23, 36, by a thief on a cross, Luke 23, 39, and by the Jewish leaders who passed by the cross, Matthew 27, 41. But such actions will certainly confront dire consequences, such as the people I am about to mention below. If you find this video useful, don't forget to like and leave a comment below this video to confirm the lesson learned from this video. Number four, Thomas Andrews, the Titanic's tragic architect. Thomas Andrews was a talented shipbuilder from Northern Ireland who dreamed of creating a ship that would become a legend in his time. His vision came to life in the RMS Titanic, a marvel of engineering, elegance, and luxury. The Titanic, the world's largest and most modern ship at the time, was a symbol of human achievement. Andrews poured his heart and soul into his design with the pointed statement that the ship was unsinkable. After the Titanic was completed, an inquisitive reporter asked Andrews about its safety. With a sarcastic tone, he replied, not even God could sink it. Little did he know that this boastful statement would haunt him for the rest of his life and would cost him his life and the lives of all the passengers and crew on the legendary ship he had created. On April 10, 1912, the Titanic set out on its maiden voyage from America to Europe. Passengers reveled in its luxury, unaware of the tragedy that was about to unfold. Four days into the voyage, disaster struck an iceberg appeared in the black waters of the Atlantic. The massive ship collided with the iceberg, tearing the hull apart. Panic set in as the Titanic began to sink. Lifeboats were scarce and chaos reigned. Andrews, witnessing the unfolding disaster, 
struggled under the weight of his creation. As the ship listed, Andrews worked tirelessly to save lives. He guided passengers to safety, urging them into the lifeboats. But the Titanic's fate was sealed. The unsinkable liner succumbed to the icy depths, taking 1,517 souls with it. Only 706 survivors clung to their lifeboats, shivering in the cold night. Among those lost was Thomas Andrews. He remained on board until the end, facing the consequences of his hubris. The tragedy of the Titanic is a stark reminder no human creation is invincible. Even the greatest achievements can crumble before the forces of nature. Thomas Andrews, once proud, met his tragic end a heartbreaking example of what happens when mortal words challenge the providence of God. And so the legacy of the Titanic lives on a cautionary tale etched into history, reminding us of the limitations and fragility of our endeavors. And keep in mind that you will never play God, or else you will meet a tragic end. Number five, John Lennon, The Beatles. John Lennon was a legend and the co-founder of The Beatles in the 1960s. Their songs have ruled the world for nearly a decade with their great music. However, Captain John consistently courted controversy with statements that were deemed blasphemous against God and believers throughout his artistic career. In 1966, John Lennon was interviewed by an American magazine, and this is what he said Christianity will end, it will disappear. I do not have to argue about that, I am certain. Jesus was okay, but his subjects were too simple today, we are more famous than him. In 1968, he even declared himself to be the reincarnation of Christ. The following year, his single The Ballad of John and Yoko caused further uproar due to its offensive lyrics directly referencing the crucifixion Christ. You know it ain't easy. You know how hard it can be the way things are going. They're gonna crucify me. Lennon's public claim of being Christ's biggest fan on the BBC fueled the fire. He also expressed dissatisfaction with the Church of England, shared his vision of heaven, and lamented not being able to marry Yoko Ono in a church due to her divorce. During a trip to Canada in 1969, he repeatedly suggested that the Beatles had more influence on young people than Christ. In 1970, Lennon's song, God, featured lyrics expressing disbelief in Jesus, the Bible, Buddha, the Gita, and even the Beatles. His iconic track, Imagine, released in 1971, faced criticism for the line, Imagine There's No Heaven, which reflected his atheistic views. Despite briefly converting to Christianity in 1977 after following certain television evangelists, Lennon met a tragic end on December 8, 1980, when Mark David Chapman, a disillusioned Christian and former Beatles fan, fatally shot him six times in front of his house and died at the scene. The irony lies in the outrage sparked by Lennon's earlier more popular than Jesus comment, and the lyrics of Imagine It remains a heartbreaking chapter in the life of a remarkably talented artist. Number six, Tancredo Neves, president of Brazil. During Neves' presidential campaign, he said if he got 500,000 votes from his party, not even God would remove him from the presidency. He did get the votes, but he fell sick a day before was made the president and died. In 1984, Neves ran for president with the help of Ulysses Guimarães. He was elected president of Brazil on January 15, 1985, by the indirect voting of an electoral college. Neves fell gravely ill on the eve of his inauguration, March 14, 1985, and died 39 days afterward. He died of diverticulitis and never assumed his position as president. While still ill, he was awarded the Grand Cross of Value, Loyalty and Merit by the Military Order of the Tower and Spade on March 27. Neves was one of the most important Brazilian politicians in the 20th century and one of the major statesmen of Brazilian history. In July 2012, he was elected one of the 100 greatest Brazilians of all time in a competition organized by SBT and the British Broadcasting Corporation, BBC. With the turn of events, one can easily conclude that all power and honor belong to God since religion is believing in and worshiping a superhuman controlling power, especially a personal God or gods. Number seven, Kazuza bisexual Brazilian composer, singer, and poet. The chapter in Galatians 6, 7 warns against deception stating that God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. God's love for us is shown when we often lose faith and deliberately indulge in self-indulgence and then repent, tell him we are sorry, and he will forgive us every time without fail. God is basically merciful and forgiving. However, he does not always forgive every action, especially the sin of publicly defaming him. And this singer is meeting a sad end. During a performance in Rio de Janeiro, Cazuza, while smoking, exhaled the smoke and declared, God, that was for you, unfortunately. 
Kazuza's life ended prematurely at the age of 32 due to a painful battle with lung cancer. These examples serve as a reminder that regardless of our accomplishments or circumstances, mocking God is not something to be taken lightly. The idea of reaping what we sow should be ingrained in our minds, emphasizing the importance of humility and respect for a higher power. From the turn of events, one can easily conclude that all power and honor belong to God. Number 8. Christine Hewitt, a Jamaican radio and television personality. Before we conclude today's video, let's briefly mention Christian Hewitt. Although there are few historical documents detailing her life, we know that she met a tragic end. In June 2006, Hewitt was found dead, her body burned inside a Toyota Taunus vehicle near Freedom Main Road in the Mount Industry District of St. Catherine. Interestingly, prior to her death, she had made a statement the Bible, the Word of God, is the worst book ever written. While we cannot definitively link her demise to divine anger, publicly criticizing the Bible is an act that challenges God's will and teachings. As we explore historical figures, let's approach them with fairness and accuracy, relying on reliable sources and factual information. As Christians, we're encouraged to show love, compassion, and understanding even toward those who face personal challenges or made mistakes in their lives. It is easy for us as believers to point the finger at those outside the church who mock God, but the most subtle mockery of God, and the most dangerous, comes from those of us sitting in church. We are guilty of mockery when we behave with an outward show of spirituality or godliness without an inward engagement or change of heart. Charles G. Finney, a preacher in the 1800s, wrote about the effects of mocking God to mock God is to pretend to love and serve Him when we do not to act in a false manner, to be insincere and hypocritical in our professions, pretending to obey Him, love, serve, and worship Him. When we do not, mocking God grieves the Holy Spirit and sears the conscience, and thus the bands of sin become stronger and stronger. The heart becomes gradually hardened by such a process. God warns that mockery of what is holy will be punished. Zephaniah predicted the downfall of Moab and Ammon, saying this is what they will get in return for their pride, for insulting and mocking the people of the Lord Almighty Zephaniah 2.10. Isaiah 28.22 warns that mockery will cause the chains of Judah's sin to become stronger, and that destruction will follow. Proverbs 3.34 says that God will mock the mocker but give favor to the humble and oppressed. 2 Kings 2.24 records the punishment that befell the youths who jeered Elisha. This is what it means that God is not mocked. There are repercussions for ignoring God's directives and willfully choosing sin. Adam and Eve tried and brought sorrow and death into the world Genesis 2.15.17.36.24. Ananias and Sapphira's deception brought about a swift and public judgment Acts 5.1.11. Galatians 6, 7 states a universal principle, do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. God cannot be deceived, Hebrews 4, 12, 13. A chance sin, Joshua 7 and Jonah's flight, Jonah 1, were not unknown to God. Jesus' repeated words to every church in Revelation 2 to 3 were, I know your works. We only deceive ourselves when we think our attitudes and actions are not seen by an all-powerful and all-knowing God. The Bible shows us the way to live a blessed life sometimes by the good examples of godly men and women, and sometimes by the negative examples of those who choose to follow another path. Psalm 113 says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither whatever they do prospers. God warns that mockery of what is holy will be punished. Zephaniah predicted the downfall of Moab and Ammon, saying, This is what they will get in return for their pride, for insulting and mocking the people of the Lord Almighty Zephaniah 2.10. Isaiah 28.22 warns that mockery will cause the chains of Judah's sin to become stronger and that destruction will follow. Proverbs 3.34 says that God will mock the mocker but give favor to the humble and oppressed. 2 Kings 2.24 records the punishment that befell the youths who jeered Elisha. This is what it means that God is not mocked. There are repercussions for ignoring God's directives and willfully choosing sin. Adam and Eve tried and brought sorrow and death into the world, Genesis 2, 15, 17, 3, 6, 24. Ananias and Sapphira's deception brought about a swift and public judgment, Acts 5, 1, 11. Galatians 6, 7 states a universal principle, do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. God cannot be deceived, Hebrews 4, 12, 13. 
Achan's sin Joshua 7 and Jonah's flight Jonah 1 were not unknown to God. Jesus' repeated words to every church in Revelation 2 to 3 were, I know your works. We only deceive ourselves when we think our attitudes and actions are not seen by an all-powerful and an all-knowing God. In conclusion, the Bible shows us the way to live a blessed life, sometimes by the good examples of godly men and women, and sometimes by the negative examples of those who choose to follow another path. Psalm 113 says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither whatever they do prospers. I hope you will find this content valuable. It is a blessing that you are encouraged to continue engaging with it and sharing it with others. Together we can enlighten and expand our understanding to others God's lovers. Please like, share, and leave comments below this video to help us spread the gospel of God. Thank you for being here, and may God bless you.